Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you are. So my name is Danielle Guizzo. I am one of the academic officers of the Association for Heterodox Economics. And I have here together with me my AHE colleagues, uh, Ingrid Kavangraven and Inko Meyenberg. And I'd like to welcome everyone to our 2021 webinar series of the Association for Heterodox Economics. So the theme of our webinar series is uh, Heterodox Economic Schools Global. And throughout the year, we're going to host monthly webinars with guest speakers from heterodox associations across the world. So we have um, an upcoming program until June, and that's already available on our website. So we're going to drop the link on the chat for you to see the, the full program until June. And today we have our launching session in the form of a roundtable with three leading heterodox scholars. So thank you to our participants, um, to our speakers actually, Alicia, Lynn and Andrew for joining. So we truly have today a global heterodox session with speakers from, from different parts of the globe. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our speakers. So first we have Dr. Lynn Chester. She's an associate professor at the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at the University of Sydney in Australia. And she's a leading heterodox economist in the application of regulation theory, which is informed by Marxian and original institutional economics. Um, her research focuses on a range of energy issues and advancing the project of heterodox economics. She is a co-editor of the Handbook of Heterodox Economics, uh, published by Routledge in 2018. She was a former co-editor between 2013 and 2019 of the Review of Political Economy, and her research has been published as book chapters in leading heterodox economics journals. She's also an advisory board member for DECON, Diversifying and Decolonizing Economics. And one of her current projects is an edited collection with Tai He Jo, provisionally titled Heterodox Economics, Legacy and Prospects, to be published online later this year by the World Economics Association. Um, our second speaker is Dr. Alicia Hiron, She's a professor of economics at the Faculty of Economics at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. And she's a leading heterodox scholar in financial economics, particularly exploring economic crisis from a heterodox and critical perspective. She's the author of several books, including 50 Years of External Debt from 1991, End of Century and um, Financial System Regulation in 2000, oh, sorry, End of Century and External Debt, History Without End, 1995, Financial Crisis, published in 2002, Japan, Asymmetries and Financial System Regulation, published in 2006, and Argentina, Its, current, uh, its Recurrent Instability from 2009. And Alicia is all, was also a member of the Board of Directors of the Latin American Council of Social Sciences, the CLACSO, from 20, 2003 until 2006. She was the president of the International Association for Feminist Economics, the IAFI, from 2014 until uh, 2015, and a member of the High Panel for Economic Empowerment of the United Nations between 2016 and 2017. And now she's currently the coordinator of the University Program of Studies on Asia and Africa since 2017. And last but not least, we have Dr. Andrew Mirman. Uh, Andrew is an associate professor at the University of Leeds in the UK and a leading scholar in economics education and economic methodology. Um, he has published extensively on the teaching of economics, particularly on curriculum design and pluralism in economics education, as well as on the nature, role, purpose and treatment of heterodox economics. And among his publications is a co-authored book with Sebastian Berger and Daniel Guizzo entitled What is Heterodox Economics? Conversations with Leading Economists in, in 2019. Uh, Andrew is, a current, uh, is currently a member of the Management Committee of the Association for Heterodox Economics, also having been uh, AHE's coordinator between uh, 2004 and 2007, and an associate of the Economics Network, a member of the Greenhouse Think Tank, and a fellow of the Leeds Institute for Teaching Excellence. Okay, so before we start, so let me just inform our participants uh, that the presentations uh, will be recorded, both video and audio. And we also ask all attendees, please, to keep their microphones muted during the session. Uh, the questions for the speakers will be collected on the chat, uh, but please bear in mind that the information that you put on the chat, both your name and the question are going to, to be recorded as well. 
And if you're having any technical issues, please, you can use the chat function to send a direct message to us if you're having any difficulties, okay? Okay, so without further ado, I think we can move to our first speaker, uh, Dr. Lynn Chester. So Lynn, the floor is yours. Um, and this opportunity to participate in the inaugural roundtable for this new exciting series. I apologize in advance for my voice, it's the end of the day. Um, and I've got to back up and start early again tomorrow morning. Um, this is the sort of initiative to which many of my comments will speak. To explain how I see the current state of heterodoxy and what I think it can offer, I actually want to start by returning to some comments that I made as a discussant at the 2011 AHE conference in Nottingham 10 years ago. But I think many of those comments still ring very true today. The papers for which I was discussant at that conference raised those perennial issues of how we define heterodoxy, pluralism vis-a-vis -vis heterodoxy and the notion of a single truth and more, of course. I stated then that how we define heterodoxy will need to be addressed on an ongoing basis. The argument will need to be maintained because the boundaries, those formal and informal institutions will keep reinforcing what is the orthodoxy. I also stated that too many of my heterodox colleagues conflated heterodoxy and pluralism. We should, as heterodox economists, consistently advocate for pluralism. And that advocacy, however, will depend on our capacity to act responsibly. And responsibility involves tolerance and respect, particularly in relation to difference. And I also stated at the time that for me, there is no single truth, which is the mindset of the orthodoxy and exactly the mindset that we need to change. And as a teacher of political economy, I constantly exhort my students that there is no one single explanation. No one perspective holds the so-called truth. Each perspective can offer insights to which we should be open. I return to these past comments of mine because many in our heterodox community still define heterodoxy as in opposition to orthodoxy. And I think it is much more. Many still conflate heterodoxy and pluralism, and many of my heterodox colleagues are not very tolerant or open to other perspectives. So in many respects, I see heterodoxy even today as replicating many of the ills of the orthodoxy. And attention and effort must be focused on this if heterodoxy is to advance, is to cement its place and legit legitimacy in offering meaningful change to the practice and teaching of economics. Otherwise, our heterodox forums and behavioural practices will be as insular and biased as the orthodoxy. That is why I think initiatives such as this global webinar series are so important. It's also why I think new strategies are needed more generally for heterodoxy. Anne Mayhew wrote some years ago that a great challenge for heterodox economists is to know when to use ideas from the past and when to reject or rethink old ones that are no longer relevant to changed economies. I think this statement equally applies to the heterodox community. We need new strategies for the future and not to re replicate past unsuccessful ones. There's often a set of propositions, or I call them a common set of propositions, posited to improve our practices as heterodox economists. And it's generally argued that we need more pluralism, interdisciplinarity in both our scholarship and education. We need to engage in dialogue with main, the mainstream. We need to establish even common theoretical foundations. We need to demonstrate real world policy relevance. We need to create separate economics, oh, sorry, separate academic departments, even find academic positions in business schools or seek to create a unified social science discipline or organise around an analytical framework, or develop alternatives to utility maximisation, or focus on a particular object of inquiry, um, e.g. institutions. In my view, these propositions are situated in the past. They will not advance the purpose of social inquiry, and they'll reinforce 
mainstream orthodox economics as the arbiter. The key weaknesses of those very commonly uh, proposed propositions are in my view, um, fundamentally they're framed around the academy in which our research and teaching environments have rapidly been transformed. Universities are now managed as corporations. Research grants are tied to strategic objectives and conditionality. There are requirements for research outputs, very measurable research outputs and external collaborations with the industry. There is increasingly um, widespread casualization. Our teaching loads have rapidly increased. We are performance reviewed and curricula have been narrowed and narrowed. These have, these have all occurred. And there's the growth in journal publishing fees. And also these propositions don't take into account the historical, geographic and cultural specificities for different schools of economic sort and are based, I believe, on mainstream standards, debate parameters, and a methodology which has marginalized heterodoxy. We need new thinking about strategies for heterodoxy. Strategies need to align with what we see as the projects of heterodox economics, which we can define in a number of ways, whether it is to advance understandings of social reality by countering orthodox conceptions, whether it's to reproduce knowledge of alternatives to and the weaknesses of the mainstream, or to participate in public policy debates, or to pr promote pluralism. I think the project of heterodox economics is all of those and more. We need a range of strategies, not a single one. We should be using media in different ways, blogs, opinion pieces, broadcast emails, webcasts, different forms of social media for multiple purposes, to engage in policy debates, disseminate our research findings, respond to criticisms of us, and to promote our publications. And we should promote and use in teaching projects like DECON's summer reading list and working groups, the INET's new lecture series, and the project of rethinking economics. We should also adopt the model of um, that was initiated by the World Economics Association of online conferences, journals, and books. These um, opportunities increase accessibility to alternatives to the mainstream. They also help to promote de debate across and within the heterodox community. And it also increases opportunities for emerging scholars. And I would also want to add a few more strategies like rethinking the composition of um, conference and seminar panels and structuring panels to achieve diversity and to include emerging scholars. This should be mandatory for all forums. We should provide mentors for emerging scholars to support participation in conferences and seminars, publications and their research agendas. We should regularly refresh curricula and teaching materials to explain contemporary events. We should not rely on one or two teaching texts, but use a bank of online materials. No one approach, as I said earlier, can explain reality. No one text can present all views and or promote critical thinking. We should organize more joint heterodox conferences like we did in 2019 every few years to widen opportunities for debate, policy debates and theoretical debates and gain a wider understanding of emerging concerns and priorities. We should engage in external collaborative teaching and research as many of us do by partnering with Chinese universities, which expands the catchment of understanding about alternatives. We should not only make journal editorial boards more diverse, but the content of journals needs to reflect diversity and greater inclusion. There's no excuse that we often hear, we tried to get more women authors, but they didn't respond or make the cut. Hello, in these COVID-19 times, who has been impacted the most? We should also consider joint or parallel journal symposia on policy issues to increase the presentation of alternatives and mandate the diversity of contributors, but not only women journal issues, special issues by women, please. This would be, in my view, another form of discrimination and even ghettoization. 
We should keep organisational and own web pages up to date with very specific attention to keywords because of searching online. There's some minor strategies in a way, but collectively they actually make a big impact. But I think there's a lot more for heterodoxy to do. So I want to finish with these comments relating particularly to the pandemic. The pandemic of COVID-19 has changed the fabric and economic structure of society. Day-to-day -day lives and the myriad of economic activities that comprise social provisioning have been rapidly transformed. Remote working, digitization of government services, mass quarantine and vaccination programs, reconfigured traffic and commuting patterns, a surfeit of buildings and infrastructure, digital crime waves, and contactless payments are just a few examples of the myriad of structural changes accelerated by the advent of COVID-19. The pandemic is a story of multiple dimensions and impacts. It is also a story of the pernicious impact of the, sorry, the accumulative effects of the past 40 years of neoliberal policies underpinned by conventional orthodox economics. Long-standing inequalities have been sharply exposed. These inequalities have been exacerbated by this pandemic, given the disproportionate impacts across populations. Although it is evident that the COVID-19 stimulus policy responses of governments do not neatly align with the tenets of neoliberalism, many of these policies have been shrouded around neoliberal rhetoric with a consistent refrain of being temporary with budgets needing to be repaired, being skewed towards business and the winding back of some measures of assistance to those most in need has already commenced. COVID-19 has also exposed the weaknesses of the neoliberal business model around which higher education sectors are structured. High dependencies on precarious workers as teachers, student fees financed by income contingent loans and international students have become central to the operation of higher education sectors around the world. Also exposed has been the co-constitutive relationship between the praxis, the teachings and practices of mainstream conventional economics and the neoliberal university. Conventional mainstream economics and all its subdisciplines through many different forms of organizational units within universities, not only reproduces neoliberalism, but in doing so, I contend acts to support the legitimacy of the neoliberal university through both constitutive and co-constitutive relationships. In other words, the entity of conventional mainstream economics through its practice can and does have causality over the neoliberal university and the neoliberal university can have causal powers over the praxis of conventional mainstream economics directions, governments, regimes, consultation processes, research arrangements, budgets and communications are a few examples as to how in practice institutional operations like a university involve continuous occurrences of co-constitutive causes and effects. Since pluralism and interdisciplinarity were stripped from the discipline, Conventional mainstream economics has offered little to address pressing and persistent issues facing society, which we all know. For example, the crises of the climate, extreme inequality, the automation of work and now global pandemics. The use of abstract models that do not match social reality and are very narrowly focused are, un are unable to provide real world policy advice. Orthodox thinking frames issues to be ones of quantification to assign probabilities to every possibility and to pose solutions in terms of trade-offs between costs and benefits. This insular approach inviscerates an issue from its context and thus an issue is falsely framed, which engenders the risk of policy complacency and government inaction. This is the economics that dominates, dominates teaching in the academy and has infused the policy making of neoliberal governments. Since COVID-19, there have been several calls for the narrative of economics to change. Others have suggested the teaching of economics should include the history of economic thought, economic history and biophysical science. These are calls for economics to return to the practice of methodological pluralism and restore history to economics. 
I concur that the praxis of economics should actively engage with alternative methodologies in history to be go, go beyond the narrow methodological approach of contemporary mainstream economics. No one system of knowledge, as Sheila Dow wrote in 1996, can claim to have captured reality, each is partial, reflecting one vision of reality. The application of multiple schools of economic thought will yield different insights into the workings of and problems generated by the capitalist economic system. However, I posit that more is needed than a change in narrative. If the social science discipline of economics is to develop the capacity to provide understanding of and policy advice to address complex and pressing real world problems, pluralism will contribute but a return to the discipline's interdisciplinary roots is also needed. The pressing real world problems of, for example, climate change or COVID-19 cannot be explained or addressed from one economic perspective, nor from the view of one discipline, given the politics, spatialization, behavioral, health, technological and other aspects involved. Barry Gills and Jamie Morgan wrote in 2020, we are living in an era of intense systemic crises and system failure. Given the power and influences of mainstream economics, in order to transform society in response to these deep crises, the field of economics must also be radically transformed. And COVID-19 has only served to reinforce this point. I totally concur. A return to the practices of pluralism and interdisciplinarity will also break the co constitutive relationship between the praxis of conventional mainstream economics and the neoliberal university. It will also jettison a key part of the armory which has legitimized the corrosive ideology of neoliberalism. Sorry, neoliberalism, I am getting tired. That for me is a critical challenge for heterodox economics. And if we step to the plate to expose and advance understandings of the contemporary university business model, Heterodoxy can offer meaningful change to the practice and teaching of economics as a social science discipline. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lynn. That was an extremely interesting and provocative talk. Um, okay, so now we have our second speaker, um, Dr. Alicia Hiron. Danielle, well, thank you very much. I am very glad to be here in this session of the Heterodox Economic Association. And thank you to Danielle, to Inko and Ingrid, and my dear colleagues, uh, Lynn and Andrew, that we are going to share this session. Well, uh, when I received the questions that Danielle uh, sent me, uh, it was the question was, how do you perceive the state of heterodoxy in your center? And so I made the first, uh, uh, the first uh, here. I, 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 I thought, well, how I am going to? What will be the title of my, of my talk? And I said, well, I'm going to talk about the Latin American through heterodox thinking. But I couldn't finish the, the PowerPoint because it. I, I have a, a lot of notes that I want to share with you. Well, as you know, first, I, I want to, do, to tell you that I studied in the School of Economics at the National Autonomous University of Mexico during the 70s. And at that time, the structuralist thought and the dependency theory were relevant in our classes. So this is very important because we have a theory to understand Latin America pro economic problems. And also one of the things that was very important in, a, in our School of Economics is that we received a lot of the great, uh, many great economies exiled from Argentine, from Argentina, from Chile, from Brazil, and also from Central America. This was because uh, the military governments expelled great thinkers of economic and, so and social science uh, which uh, brought recognized a highly Marxist economist to our university, university, and they had an heterodox perspective of what was going on on that time. So the, uh, with those uh, uh, great intellectual Marxists was uh, 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 found the postgraduate program on economics, and all the program was a left wing progressive teachers from the exile. At the end of the decade, 
uh, I was a student, I went to the uh, postgraduate program of the Latin American Studies. And in that time, we had a teacher that just arrived from France and he was, uh, uh, he decided that we must read the capital. So uh, we read during two years and we have other classes, but we read that capital. And I think the capital, what provide to me is the methodology to study not only Lat Latin America as a region, but also as a global context, be also beginning with what was 1970, 71 for all the world. And it was the, uh, uh, the, the fail of the Bretton Woods system when uh, the dollar was uh, uh, erased as good as, as the gold. And after other thing that I want to say and wh why it is very important for us as heterodox economics is how we can explain all the, the problems that Mexico has had. For example, we had uh, uh, our first evaluation. It, we, uh, uh, during 22 years, our money, the, the peso, it was 20, uh, 12.50 cents, pesos for one dollar. And so when we have these great devaluations, there were a lot of problems, but in that time, we signed the first stabilization programs with the International Monetary Fund. All what we have, uh, we have uh, uh, all the crisis, that the world has uh, have, ha, ha, has had, we have uh, we have experiment in Mexico. We have the 1976 crisis. We have the 1982 debt problems. We have then in 86, 87 the other crisis. Then we have uh, in, in 1994 the banking crisis. And so we have experimented all. All, all the financial crisis and economic crisis. And that's why Mexico is a great laboratory of all these uh, uh, stabilization programs and austerity programs. Other thing that it is very important, how the Washington consensus impact in the school of economics. If it is that during the seventies and until the beginning of the eighties, there was a spirit of another, uh, of a Latin American thought that dependency and structuralist uh, uh, thinking. Then we have a, a, a revolution of the neoclassical school. All the schools of economics erase, even they erase the development theory in the, in, in the syllabus of the of the economic, even in the school of economics, we erase uh, the class of development theory and we try to implement it all the econometric view and the neoclassical theory. This is very important because especially in the private school of economics who are uh, since the 80s and, and, and 90s, all the principal uh, economies that has uh, that are in the government in the high in the high level panel of the government are from this neoclassical story. So they have implemented all the rules that they learn in the economic schools. So UNAM was erased, especially the school of economics. This was erased to form uh, heterodox students and heterodox prof professional in to try to have a, ver a better conduct of the monetary and fiscal policy in our countries. So this is, um, I want to say this because if uh, we have uh, to, to, to improve the syllabus of our economic schools, not only in Mexico, but also in Argentina, in Brazil, in all Latin American countries. Because if you see how these pink governments during the first decade of, uh, between the 2000 and 2013, um, to, to, uh, 2010, even with Kirchner, uh, with Lula, and they have a monetary policy a neoclassical monetary and fiscal policy. So, um, how um, what I have found when you are trying to introduce 
how we have changed or how we can explain the financial crisis in our countries is that we have to use categories such as concentration and the centralization of the banking system, categories that can explain also how is the banking system in Spain, how it is in the Japanese financial system and also in China. When we see how these countries have a very close relations between the, the, their banks, their national banks, and how they have been fighting to control in a national way their financial systems, then you can understand why Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina, and the rest of the countries have had a lot of, uh, a, a lot of crisis uh, continuing with these neoclassical monetary policies. In, after I finish in the, um, the direction of the Economic Research Institute, I went to, to, to the Institute of Social Science in the University of Tokyo. And that's where I learned how the close relations of the principal um, entrepreneurs and also with the central bank. And this is very important because when you study, and then I went after the, the sabbatic in, in, in the uh, University of Tokyo, I went to study money with, uh, at the University of Missouri, Kansas City with Randall Ray, and there was Jan Kregel, Henry, well, in that time was Stephanie Bell, now she's Stephanie Colton. And I studied the mon money modern monetary theory. Is this, uh, the question is, is this modern monetary theory apply to Latin American countries? We have to think uh, how we can see if this uh, new approach in this heterodox, uh, uh, especially in the, I will say, not from the, not all the, 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 the decision of the theory that apply in Europe or in the, in some countries that are uh, that have development are applied to our underdeveloped countries. So uh, in the um, the relevance, especially for the in the to study heterodox, is that we have to understand what's going on the global south, and we need to improve more the lectures of Schumpeter, Keynes, and Miski, because. Uh, when you can, uh, when you want to explain the global financial crisis, and also the crisis that we are living right now, one of the things that I think it is very important, and that's why I compare between uh, the European Union or the how is working the Federal Reserve, of even the the Bank of China, the Central Bank of China, the popular, it's the popular pe people. Uh, it's the bank of the people of the Republic of the China, China Repu Republic, is that they have a big government. And this category of big government is very important to understand why Mexico or why our Latin American countries are, and even the African countries having improved development. We have to understand from the global south that this perspective that we are in a where all our productive sector is related, it is internet. In, in, how to say, it is internet internalization. Everything that we use every in our daily lives comes from other part of the world. If we can say that we are in a globalized uh, world, but at the same time, the big government, especially the central bank, haven't applied the fiscal and monetary policies to improve our development. What happened for, and I'm going to talk uh, about Mexico, Argentina, and Brazil. Uh, if, if you see the budget, it's it just an, a, 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 um, a, an example of kinder. If you see how the budget, uh, the public budget is, um, it, it, where does it goes? You are going to see that most of our public budget goes to pay external debt. It is incredible how we are very good students to pay every month, to pay every year, a, a such amount of billions of dollars to the hedge funds, to the, all, the, uh, all these institutional investors, 
And we, with our austerity policies, we have decreased the health system and the education system. And this is very related what happened with the microeconomic. And this is very important. And one thing that Lynn has said, how, what, what's, what, what's going right now with women in this uh, lockdown? Uh, the, um, when you try to see the macroeconomic, how the mass economic has, hasn't been well regulated and the uh, effect in the microeconomic, then you see all the, how the lack in the health, I'm going to repeat again, because what we are seeing right now with this pandemic is we have not discovered, but we haven't, we, uh, they were close to see the lack of the budget in these principal uh, issues. For example, they say the first day, they say, wash your hands. Not many people in Mexico, not many people in Latin America have access to water. And this is, we have to, why, what happened? What happened? All the, uh, the neoclassical, the neoclassical uh, uh, policies, the neoclassical thought of the people that are in the government, even with the, in, in left government, it is, this is very important. And I have to say the left government of Mexico has a neoclassical, a, 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 a neoliberal policy because they haven't, they have an austerity program that have expelled a lot of employment. And we have a very high rate of unemployment and a very lack of other in, in, in the core system, in education, and we haven't improved, even we haven't uh, uh, put more money. Mexico is the last country that have uh, uh, implemented uh, a fiscal, uh, right now, a, a fiscal uh, more, has put more money in the, in, in the, in, in the, in the productive sector. So, uh, what is my reflection of this? We have to improve as teachers. We have to uh, invite more people to, to know at least to explain what is going in our countries, what is going in Latin America, what is going in Africa. To, we have to teach them that classical view of, uh, of we have to read Schumpeter, we have to read Keynes, we have to read Minsky, and more, uh, and, and also to decolonize these um, thoughts that most of them not apply to, uh, to put a better development in our countries. Well, this is my, my, uh, my, what I was thinking after the questions that Daniel and, and Imco and, and uh, it has uh, send, it, send it to me. But uh, I think that heterodox, uh, it, heterodox is very important to understand not only the global financial crisis, 28, 29, what happened with the policies of the central bank uh, during the 90s, and what we are having this pandemic, as Aslin said, we, we are only not having a health financial crisis. We are having the problem of the climate cri crisis, the violence in our countries, the criminalization of the economy. We have a lot of problems that the only way to understand and to give alternatives is to apply to this heterodox uh, thought. Thank you very much. It was just... Uh, I hope I answered the questions. Yes, Thank you. Very interesting, Lisa. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. Um, okay, so now we have our third speaker, uh, Dr. Andrew Mirman. Hello, everybody. Um, I did record some, I did prepare some slides, but I'm not going to use them because I'm already uh, getting shouted at for a poor internet connection. Uh, so I'll just speak to, from some notes. Um, so like everybody else, I was asked to sort of talk about, um, actually, like everybody else, I'm very glad to be here. This is a great initiative. Uh, I was asked to talk my own context uh, and, and then how I see that fitting into heterodoxy and how heterodox as economics may have a role. So just, just in terms of my own context, then my own work is primarily nowadays into teaching and teaching economics. 
And there are, as, as has already been mentioned, specific issues here in terms of pluralism and what that means and how it's applied, uh, particularly around curriculum design. Uh, but and, and more importantly than that, perhaps, the, what are the overarching objectives of teaching economics? These are questions that are uh, unclear. Um, in terms of what my own sort of activity um, and status in the discipline, this type of work on teaching doesn't get published in so-called top journals. And that's true even if you're a mainstream person in the mainstream of the discipline, it's not an area that's considered important. But you can publish in sort of so-called lower ranked uh, journals, although they're very good journals. So Danny and I published, recently published in Review of Political Economy, Review, Review of International Political Economy on these subjects of economics teaching. Um, these are good journals, but not particularly highly regarded in the, the, the higher echelons of the, of the, of the, of the profession. Um, in terms of how that community operates, it's, it's actually a pretty tolerant community. Um, there's a sort of shared interest in good teaching. Um, having said that, when I start introducing arguments about pluralism, that, that is sometimes viewed with a little bit of caution at least. It's, it's considered a bit controversial. Um, is pluralism code for getting rid of mainstream economics? Uh, I think that's the suspicion. Um, so that's about the work I current, mainly currently do. Um, my current professional context is actually pretty fortunate. I work at a research intensive university, although I'm not personally on a research contract. Um, we have very good student recruitment. Um, we're not under any kind of threat in that respect. It's a genuinely pluralist group, which is, makes for a good work experience. And colleagues are very successful. Uh, they've been very successful in terms of the, the, the way in which they're measured as being successful. Um, so in terms of a lot of research outputs, uh, they've been very good. And what's interesting here in terms of strategies for heterodox economists is how they've gone about this. They've been successful by targeting uh, journals uh, which are ranked highly in business schools, because that's where we work, but not necessarily in economics. And that does actually open up possibilities for people to get recognition, promotion, etc. The other thing that my colleagues have done very well has been successful in winning grants, large grants. So I just want to talk about a few projects that have been either based at Leeds or in which Leeds makes a significant contribution. I realise this might look like an advert for Leeds. It's not meant to be, but um, that's just my context. Um, I also I've got to say I'm not a member, I'm not part of any of these projects, so I can't comment in too much detail on them. But they are worth mentioning, I think, and some of them are particularly large. Uh, so one was one a few years ago uh, on financialization, sustainability, uh, sustainable development uh, called Fessud project. It was worth about 10 million pounds. This was a very successful, productive project. Um, we're now a member of uh, a large project on rethinking macroeconomics. This is a bid that the Leeds led heterodox team actually lost, but in the process of bidding was brought back into the fold and plays, plays a mo major role. And I think what's key about these grants is that they are, well, are they're, they're interdisciplinary in many ways, and I'll come back to that in a minute, but also they, they, they're very much policy relevant and they're directed at policy. Um, and that's also true of other, other contributions that colleagues have made, for instance, in the UK treasury approach to valuing infrastructure, that's been influenced heavily by my, my colleague Andrew Brown. Uh, there's a, uh, a million pound funded project called Living Well Within Limits uh, at Leeds, actually located and led by ecological economists, but with substantial input and also collaboration with heterodox economists. And I think that's a, that's a significant development. Um, and I think this is an example where on big questions like growth and degrowth, heterodox economics is having some influence and that's being recognized even being cited in, in things like the, the, a recent OECD report on growth. And this kind of work is crucial I think uh, in having influence when we're considering the big challenges, existential challenges that, that, that Lynn and Alicia have, have mentioned, uh, particularly economic and social recovery from COVID uh, and avoiding past mistakes and using this as an opportunity or as a moment to actually do something to do something uh, productive and positive. So, so far I've talked about uh, my own context and also about some successes that he other heterodox economists have had. 
and I think I'm now going to make a shameless plug for my own, my own and also Danny's work that one of the works cited in the OECD report is actually our book on what heterodox economics is and I think it's worth mentioning that not only for self-promotion but also to try to what that book does is try to explore what what is meant by heterodox economics um, and I think I mentioned this because I want to explore very briefly, obviously, whether there's something essential to heterodox economics that explains its success in getting these grants and, and having this policy influence that I've mentioned. And what our book argues essentially is that there are three main elements of heterodox economics, but this is based upon interviews with some, some leading scholars. And this, these three elements are recognition of power and ad, an advocacy of multiple perspectives defined at different levels and also a commitment to taking ontology seriously, taking the, the, the nature of reality seriously and a commitment to realism. So power, pluralism, and realism, I think uh, what comes out of our book has been essential perhaps, or central to or key to uh, heterodox economics. And I actually do think that these three elements are, are important reasons why the, the, the colleagues I've mentioned, the projects that I've mentioned have come about. Um, so, so for example, um, many of the projects offer a theory or approach to the system as a whole. Um, so uh, one particular example of this is the systems of provision approach developed by Ben Fine and others primarily at, at SOAS in, in London. Um, that's, that underpinned the FESA projects, it's un underpinned the valuing infrastructure work, and it's also underpinned uh, the Living Well Within Limits uh, project. And what systems of provision does is it thinks about systems within systems via case studies of individual systems, of individual provisioning systems, such as housing or food. But these systems are uh, analyzed qualitatively and quantitatively. And also they're developed, they're, they're analyzed historically, they're recognized as being uh, moving through time, that concepts applied there are not transhistorical or, or, or too abstract. And these, this way of thinking has been successful uh, for colleagues, particularly when they're talking with engineers and environmental scientists. And some of the success that they've, they've had with those colleagues is to attract big grants to, to look at big real world problems on waste recovery, uh, uh, as well as infrastructure, as I've already mentioned. And that they've worked with these, work with these people using a language that they can sort of understand and share uh, and, and developed a partnership. And these partnerships have been really successful. Uh, so having that sort of overall system view of the system, but thinking about it in, as a complex system of a number of different parts, analyzing each part in a, in a pluralistic way using mixed methods and viewing that as a historical uh, specific process uh, have been very important. And another element of the, this approach, the systems of provision approach is that it thinks about how value gets created and also how value gets distributed across the system. And I think another key element which has been under, has underpinned the success of these projects uh, is this concept of value. Uh, and I'm, I'm struck by Lynn's question about, you know, what, what concepts are worth keeping and what which ones are not. Uh, and actually I think that this concept of value has proved very useful. Um, so if you think about a social provisioning as a concept of it, if you think about the, the, the world or the economy as a social provisioning system, if we go way back to Smith and the, the classical, classical political economists, there's this distinction there between use value and exchange value. Now this, this can be seen a little bit arcane, but actually the, the projects that I've talked about use this distinction quite a lot because it helps them to understand social provisioning systems, business models, government funding, government uh, fiscal policy in slightly different ways. <clears throat> so basically systems that focus on use value are aiming to provide for the needs of the community. So they have to include social values, environmental values, the kind of thing that ecologists talk about. Um, they're, they're, they're inherently therefore collective and a bit longer term. Whereas exchange value systems, uh, they drive social provisioning to focus on, on market value. Right? And I think this basic distinction is actually still quite useful. You've got one type of system driven towards use value, another type of system driven towards uh, exchange value. Um, and th because these systems are different, it's useful to recognize that distinction. 
within exchange value, you still you can also make a distinction between uh, a short, a sort of longer term vision uh, around the creation of exchange value, uh, and on the other hand, a shorter term vision, perhaps arranged around the idea of capture of exchange value, uh, for instance, through the creation of financial assets. So this is where the concept of financialization fits in. Um, the second model, the, the capture of exchange value, is much more short-termist. It's much less rooted in any particular place, much less collaborative. And it's also, for all those reasons, more prone to crisis. So this has implications for business models, for societal organization, but also for things like government and their, their policy on how to provide things. Local government, for instance. Um, local government are, are faced with revenue crises all the time. The prevailing orthodoxy is to say, right, sell your assets, capture the exchange value now, get that market value, get it, get it in now. But of course, this just leads them into this shrinkage where they, they then have less revenue, they sell more there, then have less revenue, they sell more, and they end up being utterly uh, impotent. And these, the consequences of this can be seen, as we've already mentioned, in the COVID crisis, that the structures, the social structures needed to deal with this are simply not there. And the care systems and, and linkages with healthcare systems are simply uh, simply not there. So rather than getting local governments to sell their stuff, you say, OK, keep them, use them as assets, invest in them, use them as ways of generating revenue stream and generating, creating exchange value. This is a, a longer term approach. It re requires investment. And these have uh, pro-social outcomes compared with the sort of short term view. So obviously touched on a lots, lots of things here very briefly. Um, what I would say is I think then the value of heterodox economics is that it is economics. Uh, it's not sacrificing that label and that's important because uh, the label of economics is still important I think and useful and, and has some cachet despite uh, some of the things that economists have, have done. Um, but it offers a difference, it offers an alternative and it includes dimensions that are usually excluded like institutional structures, power, uh, politics, ethics. Um, and all of these things are necessary to think about these existential problems that we face. So I think the case for heterodox economics is that it offers different ways of thinking about these things and frameworks for thinking about these things. So even though the environment's difficult, we have to remain sort of hopeful and think about things that we can do and, and not focus so much on how rubbish things are. I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, Andrew. It's a very interesting presentation, um, although I'm biased to say, of course. Uh, okay, so I think we can go for a uh, round of questions. So I'll now pass to Ingrid and Inko, who will collect a few questions, then I'll come back with few more. Thank you so much to all the speakers and to Danielle as well. Um, so we're already getting some questions in the chat. Um, what I want to ask, I'll incorporate two of them in two general questions to the speakers. So I'll ask one kind of inward looking one on how we can do better and then one forward looking one. Uh, so Lynn already mentioned how heterodoxy itself is often intolerant of other perspectives and at times runs the risk of replicating many of the ills of orthodoxy, as she said. So that's an important thing to keep in mind uh, for us. And Alicia also mentioned um, how a lot of heterodox economics isn't relevant for the global south uh, with the infamous example of MMT. And um, so the question is, so are there other weaknesses um, that we need to address as a heterodox community. Um, so an example would be from our annual conference that we're um, currently um, asking for uh, papers for. Uh, so that one is about how heterodoxy can help us understand racial and gender inequalities. So turning that question to our own communities, uh, it's becoming quite uh, obvious, especially recently, the heterodox communities themselves are often dominated by uh, white, Anglo-American, men, uh, many identities are excluded and uh, many scholars from many locations are excluded, which relates to a couple of the questions in the chat. So Jalid Ahmed asked, 
why don't we find the non-Western economic thought in academic fields throughout the world? And uh, Pratyush Sharma asked, is there a movement to de decolonize heterodox economics as well? Uh, should there be? So are these things that you consider weaknesses? And if they are, how do we address them? So that's the inward looking one about the weaknesses of the field and how we address them. And then the second one, forward looking. So how do you see the future of heterodox economics, especially for the next upcoming generation of economists? So there are many uh, early career and young scholars in the, uh, in the audience here. So um, what can they, we expect uh, and demand from the heterodox communities? Uh, so we can go in the order that we started. Um, so start with Lynn. Um, I think in answer to your first question that you posed, the sort of the inward looking question, I sum it up in terms of diversification. That's what we can do better, which also I think will address the weakness that uh, Alicia um, posed in terms of the relevance or irrelevance a lot, a lot of heterodoxy to the global south. Um, I know it's easy for me to sit here as an older white woman and say diversification will help solve. There was an interesting um, exchange on Twitter recently about diversification. Um, I won't go into details about it, but I was then subjected to a number of emails from one of the tweeters and several white older male colleagues who call themselves heterodox economists. And the and I use this example because this is one, one of the things I was pointing to, the refrain, oh, we tried to diversify. Well, yeah, but you didn't try hard enough and you used old strategies. Putting out, for example, a call for papers will not necessarily lead to greater diversification. You've got to plan, you've got to think, you've got to have new strategies to contact through networks to encourage a diversity of contributions, be it within a, a, um, a special issue of a journal or a seminar or a panel or a conference or even to mentoring new emerging scholars. We've got to diversify. And when we diversify, we get a greater richness of voices and a richness of voices and insights which become more relevant to the problems, e.g. of the global south. It's a bit like um, the imperialism of orthodox economics. We just can't have the imperialism of heterodoxy on all these areas. It's got to be much more a diverse, a diverse collection of people um, with heterodox views and practicing heterodox views. And there's a very different, um, a very different voice does come through, through that diversification. Um, I, I hold, um, maybe my comments seemed somewhat pessimistic, but I do hold hope and I am optimistic that we can diversify as a community, but we've all got to practice it. We've all got to practice it, not just fall back and expect others to take up that call. Um, I think once we do diversify far more strongly, um, we will see um, the richness that Andrew referred to in terms of the influence in policy making um, that we have not seen in all areas around the world. I mean, I find, found Andrew's comments quite interesting because it's not, um, those changes are not evident in Australia and I don't believe they're evident, um, say, in North America. Um, so I come back, I think diversification and we need persistent strategies and persistent Require, persistence requires effort. So effort means you don't go forward with um, activities, events, proposals, publications, whatever, without consciously creating diversification. And I'll give you the example of the, um, the handbook that was published a few years back. I mean, the three of us set out, the three editors set out quite deliberately we are going to have a diverse collection of authors. We're not just gonna have the same old, same olds. 
which, by the way, keep popping up in all those special issues that seem to have been published during the pandemic. We didn't want the same old, same old. And we wanted scholars from Latin America and from Asia. And we wanted more women. And it took a lot of effort, but we did get greater diversification than previous um, publications. And it wasn't the same old, same old. One of the um, reviewers of the proposal said, well, why would anyone want to read um, chapters from unknown scholars that are not established? And that's, that's part of the bias against which we face. And I think that's why we've got to persist. And it means, as I said earlier, it means effort, effort at creating diversification. But I'll stop let, there and let the others have an opportunity. Thank you so much, uh, Alicia. <laughs> well, Ingrid, I want to say many things, <laughs> but <laughs> well, I, uh, I, I'm, I try, I'm going to try to organize my, my thoughts. Well, uh, one of the things that I would like to say is especially why people from the global south aren't writing articles, research articles in the journals, even in the journals that are, uh, it's supposed that there are with a, an heterodox view. Uh, all the, uh, any, all the, all the journals that I have seen, uh, they have a methodology that describes the hypothesis with a model. And sometimes you, you must not have a model, an econometric model to go to a, a conclusion. And I think this is the lack, and this is the new, it's a new way to make research from, in, from the, in these journals that may not allow people from the global south to describe more what is the situation that we are living. And this is a new concept of how to, how to make the research. Uh, the research must be situated you must describe what is the problem and from them, then you go to the theory. Uh, I'm going to give you um, an example. For example, woman microcredit in the, in the global south. Most of the microcredit are for women. If you see the ROA and the ROE and, and the, um, the profits, uh, the conclusion that you have uh, seeing, seeing these microfinance institutions is that women are very profitable. Okay, and, ma and microfinance is one of the drivers in the document of the high level panel for women econ uh, empowerment. And microfinance for women is the, is the real where you are going to have a better income, a better, a very, a, a better income distribution, a better life, so this is terrible because if you relate this, my, 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 uh, this microfinance plus, they are more of them, they, are in, they, they come from the financial market that comes from the big hedge funds or the, or the institutional investors. So you have to see what's going in this, in the global south, then you have to relate it with the macroeconomic level. And then you are going to explain why this microfinance is very important and how this microfinance is in the agenda 2030. And also in all that, it is incredible how it is in all the documents of the IMF and in the World Bank when all the agenda it depends on the share shareholders. So this is incredible why, how we have to discover what is behind this, um, this research work. So I think one of the things that has to change, especially is the journals, how they are trying to find research, uh, how they are uh, public, uh, the publication, they are very high research, uh, the, the research, how they are, explaining, and I think this has to, to, to change. I don't think that it is that bad, but it is, they have to change. And another thing that we have to fight, we have to fight in that, that especially in the global south and also 
in all that global world, we have to return to a new syllabus in economics. We have to read Hilferdin, we have to read uh, Schumpeter, Keynes, Minsky, but not uh, but uh, direct to their papers. And I think we have to form new uh, pro, pro, uh, new people. And that and that is where is the future. The future of heterodox is that we as teachers try to have a more diversity of others, the classical of authors of the heterodox thing, uh, thought. So when people arrive to the government, they can have better decisions and also to try to understand how the financial circuits work in the macroeconomic level and also in the microeconomic level. And we have to change the mess economy. We have to change the public policies and especially public policies that uh, came from the austerity programs of the big government. I'm sorry, but I am sick of austerity. So in, in every Zoom that I have, and I have the opportunity to, to talk, I have to confess that I am against austerity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, Andrew, do you have anything to add? Uh, I mean, it's, a, it's a huge topic, isn't it? I think um, obviously there's a sociology of economics, which is located within a much bigger power structure. And all of those things are pushing us in the direction, in, in an opposite direction. Uh, so the, the, the discipline is dominated by a few American universities that publish the textbooks that decide what the best journals are. And then if you look at a curtain, I refer it again, not to self publicize too much, but in Danny and I's paper about Brazilian economics, we identified that there's been this sort of shift that uh, um, in, a, in a quest to sort of get international recognition, there's been a push to publish in international journals and do less work in uh, Brazilian journals and, and about Brazil. Uh, and do uh, more just sort of generic work uh, that will get into these so-called top journals. Um, and that's that's a structural problem, uh, which is you know inherent to economics as a discipline, but also much bigger than economics uh, as a discipline. So there, there are huge there are huge challenges there. Um, I think by I mean there's a, there's a movement in, in UK education at the moment, particularly around inclusive education. And one of the things that that does is try to say, uh, we, have to, we have to reveal the hidden structures. We have to reveal what's hidden. Uh, why is it that somebody that, that comes from a, a, a more disadvantaged background or comes from an, who is an international student, why do they struggle, or sometimes struggle when they come to a, a British university? Is it they're just not good enough? No, of course it isn't. It's because a British university has got this hidden curriculum of norms and, uh, and social processes that they don't even know are there. And so being inclusive is actually trying to change those norms and structures, but firstly also to reveal those norms and structures, not least to the people within them. Um, so I think Lynn, Lynn's uh, injunction is particularly, yeah, it's right to look at ourselves and talk to ourselves. If we're gonna talk the talk, we've got to walk the walk and and we, we have got to consistently identify what the problems are and then think about how we can Deal with them and the, the kind of strategies that we that, that, that she and Alicia have both talked about, I, I support. And you know, I have to look at my own practice and my own thought about how how, how good am I at this, and um, be honest sometimes and say, oh, I'm a middle-aged British white man. It's fine. Um, uh, what incentive do I have to change? And I have to say no. That's 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 wrong. And I'd be part of groups like this that, that we can that we can use to, to start to change things. One thing the AHE does is organise an annual uh, training workshop for PhD students, which has been very useful in creating an, a new generation of people. Uh, and many of the people I can I can see on the screen here have been to those. Um, one of the things that one of the things that th we're doing this year is doing this online, and and we hope that that will mean that we get an even bigger diverse. Uh, group, a group, of, a more diverse group of people. We've changed the scheduling so it, it hopefully allows people in different time zones to to participate. Um, and we, because we don't have to fly people in and pay for food and things like that, we we're not as restricted by budgets. So we can we can actually deliberately uh, bring in people from. We've always tried to bring in people from all over the world, but we've been able, maybe only been able to have a couple of people from outside Europe 
I'm hoping that this year we can have a much, a much more diverse group. And it's small changes like that, well, they're, they're better to make than not to make. Um, and by doing that slowly, I mean, why aren't, why aren't more non-Western theories taught? Um, and again, I'm quite guilty of this. I even teach a, a philosophy course to PhD students, which is entirely Western philosophy. And the Eastern philosophy is completely ignored because I don't know enough about it. That's my own training, but also lack of perhaps, you know, lack of incentive to have to go and to learn it. And that's part of the problem. But if we change the if we change the, the, the nature of the conversation, the, the diversity of the of the community, those those ideas will will they will force their way in. But we have to we have to open the door. They, they, they're not perhaps strong enough to force their way in on their own. We have to open the door and invite people and uh yeah, and I, yeah I, think, I think it's important that we understand the problem and we do things in our own terms. Uh, the, the last thing I was going to say is a slight caution note that everyone agrees with pluralism, right? Um, what does it actually mean? Everybody agrees, everybody agrees with diversity, but partly they agree with it because that means you can individualise everything and personalise everything and break down social connections. That is not the way we want to approach it. We have to approach it in the way that we want to approach it. Lynn's shaking her head, so I'll, I'm interested to hear why she disagrees. Great, thank you so much. Um, oh, sorry, do you want, want to respond quickly? Yeah. Um, no, I just think Andrew's got a rather weird definition of um, diversity. It's not what I would share. When I talk about diversification and, and different voices, you know, I'm thinking of, um, and I'll give you an example of, of two of our PhD students. One is from Brazil, um, another one is from South Africa and another one is from India. And they have brought a richness to our internal debates um, because they frame things in ways as young scholars that us old white people that have been educated by the mainstream don't. And they challenge our use of um, language, how we problematize things um, and go to Alicia's point about situating things, saying this will not apply in Brazil or this is just foreign to us. It's very Anglo. That's what I mean by diversification. I don't mean about individualization. So, yeah, I'm getting uh, a bit I, feisty I because it's nearly midnight my time. <laughs> Now, can I just be clear oh, as well? That's, it is quarter past twelve. Can I just be clear that's exactly my point? That there is a danger that diversification can be treated in a way that we don't want it to be treated, and we have to we have to own what we mean by it, and we have to we have to act on those principles. That's what I mean. I completely agree with what you just said. I agree. And the other thing I would add about diversification is when institutions like universities claim they've got diversity strategies. What they do is they mainstream it and they manage it and they remove it from those that are actually excluded. And those that are actually excluded should be part of those strategies. And that's what we also need to practise too. That's why I'm really concerned as an older person that we do get emerging scholars as part of our discussions and debates. So we consciously seek their involvement. We consci consciously seek to help them with publication programs. I mean, it's pretty daunting when you start as a young scholar being mentored by someone who is willing to take the time and trouble. I think that will enrich our heterodox community better than a lot of other things. Thank you. These are really um, helpful reflections and really important discussions to have about what diversity means for heterodox economics, uh, because what's um, unique about heterodox is that we do look at structures, right? So we can't, shouldn't fall into the traps of uh, um, individualizing a mainstream way of looking at diversity. Uh, so we only have 15 minutes left. So I'm going to pass on to Imko to ask a final question before we wrap up. Hey, thank you, Ingrid. Um, to all three speakers and being aware of the time, uh, please keep your answer short. But um, I want to know from you, and I think it touches a little bit on what Alicia said about 
uh, teaching earlier, is how can the community and maybe also the association specifically inspire young scholars to join and become heterodox economists? So Lynn first and then Alicia and finally Andrew, please. You've actually raised a very, very interesting question in terms of my own um, university, because the opportunities to encourage young scholars to come and study with us are being removed. Um, I would call it the production of knowledge is being narrowed. Um, it's being forced by um, uh, changing fee structures imposed by the national government, but it's also being um, imposed by my own faculty um, on the basis of COVID-19 has um, oh, reduced our revenue because our international students can't travel to Australia, so they don't want to enrol in our courses. International fees are still being paid because they're connecting to us online. It is in, because, but my point is, as we're narrowing the programs we're delivering, it is really hard to encourage young scholars to come and join us. Um, but my colleagues and I have embarked on an exercise where we are trying to um, get around um, having just limited opportunities. We are revising all of the descriptions of um, our offerings. Um, sounds minor, but given that one of those units that we deliver, the description was created over 30 years ago, it should have been done a lot sooner. We are also expanding our program of um, inviting scholars, as more established scholars, but younger scholars to join us as honorees and actually deliver um, online contributions to seminars that double as teaching contributions, because we want to expose um, students and potential students to what we can offer them in terms of heterodoxy. We, we in the Department of Political Economy, yes, we have an international reputation, but we don't really um, maximise it to attract young scholars. And that's what we're setting out to do. Um, yeah, that's what we're setting out to do in a very localised sort of way. Um, and, but I think the same could apply elsewhere because the same are experiencing similar sort of austerity as Alicia referred to. I think also, I'm going back to the point I've made a number of times, um, I'll say today, but it's now tomorrow for me. Um, it is about mentoring to bring young scholars on um, and mentoring is like a supervision of um, a postgrad or um, even just an honor student. I think we've all got to make more time for mentoring to bring young scholars on. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Alicia, please. Well, um, one of the, uh, I'm going to teach in a few minutes the class of uh, global structural economy. What do I do in that class? Even that after that class, there's another that it's international commerce. And then the official uh, syllabus is to read Krutman book. So I think that you as, as teacher, you must not teach with a Krutman book. I think you must try to find other lectures that can induce the student to question, to question the economic science. And one of the, my, my, what I use in this uh, global structural economy is that my first class is this book. It's the, it's the Mark Laboa book of the, the post-Cagnation economy. And the first class that I have, that I am going to begin is to show them the table that has this book about what is the difference between neoclassical and heterodox. You know, the students arrive to the, econom to the School of Economics and the first class is that economy is a science that study the um, 
the resources, the, the scare, uh, uh, recursos escasos, is, uh, is, you understand me. And that's a myth. So the problem is that even they have all these uh, four or let's say about, I think eight, eight semesters, then they go to the master and they uh, arrive to the PhD and they just, they don't know what is heterodox and what is neoclassical. So I, we, I think that we must move and we must um, invite more, more uh, teachers to understand the difference between neoclassical and heterodox and to try to, uh, to invite them to take that hetero, uh, heterodox um, uh, pre, 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 propositions. And that's, I think this is the labor of, of us and also uh, the labor to that more young economists or, or social scientists are uh, try to be in the heterodox and also to situate the knowledge. This is very important because if you, if they ask, sometimes they ask me if monetary, in the, the modern monetary theory is it uh, right for Mexico? Well, we have an agreement. We we sign an agreement. The North the NAFTA agreement in the 14th chapter. We signed that the monetary policy and the fiscal policy must be very close to the to the Fed to the Federal Reserve of USA. Now we sign another agreement, the UMSCA, and it is the same. So how can you uh, um, apply modern monetary theory? in an economy that it is integrated to the US economy and, and also in Canada. So I think we have to question all the, what we teach and how we conduct our students to a better economy and a better life. Thank you very much. Um, I'm tempted to say that um, about inspiring young people. I mean, it's a long time since I was one, so in some ways I've got no idea. Um, but I think being less facetious, I think people are genuinely curious about how things work and they're facing uh, a very uncertain future and they want to understand it. And so I think you have to start with, um, so I, I, I'm talking primarily now about maybe undergraduate education. Uh, you have to start with the idea that economics can teach you something about the world, but you need to and that's what it's about. Um, and it's not about learning a canon because there's no point in learning a canon unless you're gonna go on and do a PhD in mainstream economics. Um, so why not expose people to uh, a few perspectives might actually help them understand what's going on. Uh, and that's certainly a strategy that I've always pursued. So make changes in the curriculum, make changes to classes, particular courses, um, but then also uh, raise the question, you know, what is the curriculum for? And what is economics education about? Uh, and if you if you raise that question, it quickly becomes obvious that simply reproducing the what, what's there now is not a very good reason for teaching economics. Uh, and if you can come up with a better reason, even if that includes uh, giving people better skills to become employable, well, how do you do that? Well, one is to get them to be critical thinkers and to, to be able to pro, weigh up pros and cons and deal with a particular problem and try and think about how to how to solve that. These are all really useful. Um, so just in terms of undergraduate education, I think there are lots of reasons for, for diversifying the curriculum. And it, it, we do what we can, depending on what kind of positions of power we're in, uh, whether we, if we're running a department or running a program, we can get things done. If you are a teaching assistant on a, on a, on a big module, it's hard for you to do things, but maybe you can make small changes. Um, and a completely the other end of the scale is people coming, trying to think about whether to come into the discipline and uh, become academics, do PhDs. Lynn's point about mentoring is really important. Um, and I think there are a lot of, you know, heterodox economists, heterodox economics attracts a particular type of person possibly who wants to get things done and be, be activists and change and improve the world. I think that's true of mainstream economists as well, but they do it in such a different way. Um, and there's a tension that people sometimes feel between my academic, their academic work and, and their, their political work, and they're not sure where to, where to put their efforts. Uh, and, I, and I don't know what advice to give on that. I think you just have to be honest about what the environment is like. Um, it's not easy. 
it's not easy to, easy to succeed in economics, but you can succeed in other areas uh, by using your economics and taking them, uh, taking them to those areas. So I've already mentioned ecological economics. Um, there's fields like polit political economy, um, which perhaps allow you a little bit more latitude to do things than you, you, you would be allowed in a, in a mainstream or a typical economics, a typical economics context. And then giving people advice about how to, you know, how to publish, how to collaborate, um, thinking about interdisciplinarity. I think that's very important um, because you know all the major problems of the world are, are interdisciplinary ones, and no single discipline uh, is going to be solve any of them. You so you have to learn how to work with people. If you can make economics a bit more open as well, then that will help. But you certainly need to be able to talk to other people from other, other disciplines. So those are the kind of pieces of advice. And again, going back to the PhD workshop we run, we do have a time devoted to exactly that topic about, you know, how could you strategize your own career? And, you know, what is what is it like being an academic economist? And how do you deal with that? And what strategies can you can you use? And I, I think that that element is really important. Um, Lynn does touch on another important point that you've got to have these programs, these programs have got to exist. Uh, and that's that's a whole nother question. You've got to make sure that they exist and keep fighting for those. Okay, thank you very much, all three of you. I leave lead back to Danielle for the closing comments. Thanks very much, everyone. I know we have to run, uh, especially Alicia. I know she's teaching in a few minutes. So just to yeah wrap up, uh, I'd like to thank the speakers once again for their very interesting uh, presentations and also for our participants to join. And just before we leave, I'm just going to uh, share the slide that we have with the, um, the upcoming seminars or upcoming webinars actually that we're going to find over the next few months here. So this is our program. If you can, I think you can see. Yeah, okay. So, okay, our next webinar is on the end of March. So on the 26th of March, we're gonna have Dr. Nicolas Boskin from Argentina, the Society for Critical Economics. And yes, we're gonna continue with a very exciting program until June. And then our call for papers for the conference in July is already open. So I'm gonna leave the, the link on the chat. And you can also register for the postgraduate workshop that Andrew mentioned. So I think that's it. We, we can wrap up. So thanks very much once again for stop sharing for the participants and for the speakers. And it was a pleasure seeing you all. And yeah, looking forward to seeing you in March. Thank you. Thank you.